Welcome to the Center for Brain Health and our fourth and final lecture of this series for February 2016. My name is Joel Roebuck and I'm on the uh, advisory board of the center and we're honored and delighted that you're here. The uh, first thing I want to do is, is thank really two organizations who have really been instrumental in, in helping make these lectures so successful in addition to y'all coming to the lectures. One is, is the Container Store. This is the ninth year that they have participated and supported us. They want us to organize our closets. We want all of us to organize our minds. Secondly, and just as important, is Quest Capital Management Company, Kalita Blessing and Ed Blessing. They are the sponsors for tonight's lecture. So Kalita, we're grateful for your support also. The mission of the center is very simple. We want to understand, to heal, to protect, and enhance the brain. And we have been working vigorously to do that. We have over 70 research projects going at any one point in time. But we are more than research. We want to take it to that next level. A wise philosopher once said, the person who invented the first wheel was smart. But the person who invented the other three was very, very smart. <laughs> and that's what we want to do. We want to take the research that comes from the center and all the various projects that we have going and apply them to people who have needs, who have healing problems with their brains, who want to protect their brains, who want to enhance their brains. So that is the, the, the four wheels that we want to be rolling forward with, not just one wheel, but we want to take that research to the next level so that we can help people improve their brain performance. And we've been doing that for several years. We worked with probably 2,000 warriors who have PTSD. We've trained over 40,000 teens in seven different states to enhance their brain performance. And we're just really expanding these different areas where we've determined that we can enhance our brain performance. One of the ways that we're going to be doing that is with the Brain Performance Institute, located just to my left outside where a new building is being constructed. And that building will be where the Brain Performance Institute will be located, where people can come and these different techniques that we have discovered that are proven research to help people improve their brain performance. So we are, we're excited and we believe that there is a revolution in brain health. 30 years ago, it was physical health and physical therapy. Well, today we believe there's a brain revolution that's going on and we're gonna see a quantum leap in terms of research and brain health performance over the next several years. We encourage your participation. We're, we're delighted, as I mentioned earlier, that you're here. Uh, we hope that you will participate at whatever level you would like. You can check our literature in the lobby or our website uh, so that you can see different ways for you to be involved in the Center for Brain Health. So thank you for being here, and I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Gregory to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Man has done much to influence the arc of scientific advancement. Despite the contributions to date in chemistry and pharmacology, few things can compete with the staggering elegance and efficiency of natural biological processes. There is a renaissance underway to influence our natural biology in order to treat disease. One example is immunotherapy and cancer, where we are restoring body's natural defense mechanisms the response rate and survival rates have been staggering and sets up a 20 plus billion dollar drug class. Another example is gene therapy, where we're using viral vectors to fix DNA, the own source code of our own biology, and enable the production of healthy proteins 
that forestall the progress of disease. Tonight you're going to hear about the power of the microbiome, the 100 trillion bacteria, fungi, and protozoa, and virus that live in and inside our body. The microbiome is involved in extracting energy from food, producing essential vitamins, regulating our immune system and metabolism, and protecting against disease-causing microbes. And in a realm very near and dear to many in this room, the microbiome has a huge impact on the brain. We have the honor to hear from a scientist at the forefront of this exciting field. Dr. John Cryan is our distinguished guest and speaker this evening. He is professor and chair of the Department of Anatomy and Neuroscience at the University College Cork, internationally rec recognized microbiome scientist, prolific author of over 250 peer-reviewed articles in scientific literature, and as you will see, an engaging and supremely interesting individual whom we are extremely appreciative to have join us this evening, Dr. Cryan. Uh, thank you very much, Gregory, for those very kind words. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'd like, firstly, to, to really thank Sandy for inviting me here to share with you all um, the journey that we've been on uh, in Ireland, uh, uh, trying to explore how the gut microbiome could be one of the core regulators of brain health. And Hippocrates, who's the father of all medicine, has said that all diseases begin in the gut. And perhaps maybe all treatments can also begin in the gut. And if you take nothing else away from my meanderings over the next 45 minutes or so, I hope that's what you might take away, is that there might be real science behind these gut feelings, and it's not just my gut feeling that there's something in this, that you might think there's a, have a gut feeling that there's something behind all of this. And it's a, you know, billion dollar industry that's taking off and it's supported by really exciting science. So that's where I, I, I'll begin. So I, I work, and I am Irish, and I work in Ireland. Uh, and so I, every time I come to the US, I always like to remind people of a little bit of geography. <laughs> not, not nothing, but most people are able to pick out where Ireland is. What I like to just to point out is we're not the United Kingdom. We're not united, and we're not a kingdom. So it's important for people to just think that, you know. That said, people may not know where Cork is. And Cork is the second city in Ireland, Dublin being the capital. And this is all you need to know about the geography of Ireland. Uh, and we're here, and we're very proud of being here, and we make a lot of noise. And in general, that's what people, you know, the Irish population of the whole island is less than five million, but we make a lot of noise. And so hopefully you can see the amount of noise we're making in this really cool area of how microbiome uh, shapes um, the brain uh, overall. And I have a five-year-old son, and I, you know, in, T telling him some bedtime stories, I, 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 his favorite story is that of Pinocchio, The Adventures of Pinocchio. Most of you know it. And in this story, you have um, a puppet who's sculpted by the puppeteer Geppetto, and throughout his life, he relies on Geppetto to get him out of some of the uh, uh, misadventures that he gets into. And Geppetto is this avuncular uh, watchdog of the puppet throughout his entire life. And in a way, that's how I've kind of began to see the parallels between this story and what's going on in relation to our microbiome and how it's playing a role in looking after our brain. And perhaps that's one of the things. And one of the questions I always like to, to ask is about who's really in control? And neuroscientists, we're very, very focused on what's going on above the neck. And perhaps 
what's, and, and how that's controlling everything. And we're very snobby about the brain, and we think you know, how important it is, but maybe we need to think a little bit broader. And so we'll come back to this uh, a little later. And so where does all of this story begin? I mentioned Hippocrates, but let's fast forward to uh, millennia, and we come to rural Michigan uh, in the 1840s. And there you have a, a US Army surgeon called um, William Beaumont. And Beaumont was one of the first type of prototypical clinician scientists. He was very much trying to do experiments to find out how the body was working. And at that time, we knew very little about the digestive system. And he had a, he had a patient, a Canadian fur trader, uh, called Alexis St. Martin. And St. Martin, uh, unfortunately, has a gunshot wound to his abdomen. And uh, he almost died. But Beaumont saved him, being the good surgeon, and saved his life. But a fistula, or a hole, emerged in his abdomen. And Beaumont said, now, this could give me real, literally, insight into what's going on in the gut. And so, you can, as you see here, he decided to start performing experiments. This was before ethical committees really uh, came into action. And so he kept, uh, and Alexis uh, uh, St. Martin was so happy to be alive that he was just so thankful for, initially. Uh, to, this great, <laughs> to this great surgeon. And so he started doing experiments, started ex trying to see what different food stuff would do, putting different food stuff in, looking at all of this. And he wrote about it very well in his classical textbook, which is the, fo the, the foundations of modern gastroenterology. Now, why am I telling you this if you're interested in the brain? Well, one of the things that he wrote about was that if St. Martin, and this happened over many years, so he kept him as his slave, uh, you know, <laughs> helping out in the, for many years. But when St. Martin would become angry or irritable, and who's to blame him if someone's shoving a pound of corned beef into his side on a regular basis, he might. But he noticed that, Boma noticed that it affected the rate of digestion. That your feelings, your emotions, are really gating what's going on in your gut. That your brain is regulating your gut and your physiology. That we have a brain-gut axis. And that's very important. And with the advent of brain imaging in the 1980s, we are able to see that this is actually bi-directional. That if we stimulate the gut and do colonic distension, we can actually visualize that in the brain. And so the, the, the importance of the brain good axis started to emerge. Now, it's been accepted in areas like food intake and satiety, uh, but in, and very much taken in areas of complementary medicine. But in traditional medicine, it was somewhat ignored, and neuroscientists didn't really want to, to engage with this. And that's despite the fact that we have more neurons in our gut than we do in our entire spinal cord. And that's important. Our, we have our second brain here, and it's very important for this. There are many routes of communication between the gut and the brain, and I just want to mention one here called the vagus nerve, uh, because I'll come back to that later, and the vagus nerve is, is, is an important part of our story because it's one of the cranial nerves that, that is able to gate what's going on in the periphery and sending signals, a long wandering nerve uh, that's quite important. So as I said, neuroscientists have somewhat ignored this, and that's despite, as I already alluded to, it being part of our everyday language. We personify our emotions in our gut. We use phrases like gut instinct, gutted if you're disappointed, it's a gutsy move, you have butterflies in your tummy if you're feeling uh, nervous, uh, and so, and, and this is not just in English, in many other languages the same way. Yes, it's still seen as a little bit out there for neuroscientists to consider this and to think about it. So I'm a, I, I, I'm a um, stress neurobiologist, is if I have to put myself into a bracket, which is sometimes getting more difficult. But for the last over two decades, I've been interested in how stress affects the brain and how stress affects the body. And, and one of the things that, that we're really interested in is why on the roller coaster of life, 
if two people are subjected to the same stress, why is someone more uh, uh, um, susceptible? But more importantly, why is someone more resilient? And Hans Selye, who's the father of stress research and coined the term stress, he said, it's not stress that kills us, but it's our reaction to it. And sometimes I wake up and wonder, why aren't we all suffering from stress-related disorders? God knows you just have to turn on the TV and uh, in the morning or the radio and, and see what's going on in the world all around you. And you would wonder, why, why aren't we? And what are the factors that are at play? And maybe we know genetics plays a role. We even know more recently this epigenetics, which is the, the, uh, even at another level. But what if it's got to do with something going on in our gut and something between our gut and our brain talking to each other? And the other important thing I want you to take away from this is when we're talking about stress, uh, as neuroscientists, and I'm guilty of this too, is we get very focused on what stress and chronic stress and traumatic stress in particular, what they do to the brain and what they do to some neurons within the hippocampus or other brain areas. And we get very focused on that part. But it's very essential to realize that stress is a whole body disorder and it affects every system in the body. And these all interact with the brain and are playing key roles in regulating each other in different ways. We know, for example, in, in the immune system, which plays a key role in, 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 in signaling to the brain that stress will have a key role there. And moreover, even directly in the gut, that stress will affect the barrier function, which then allows certain immune molecules to get in and, 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 and you get an inflammatory state, which will affect then the brain and you have a whole cycle of what's going on. And so slowly, we're beginning to see that stress is this whole body disorder. And a number of years ago, we were interested in um, particularly stress early in life. And so we wanted to see you know, the long-term consequences in an animal model, what would happen if, if, if animals are stressed early in life. And we find that these animals that grow up, they have changes in their behavior, they're more likely to be depressed, they're more anxious, they have changes in abdominal pain, they have more irritable bowel syndrome-like uh, symptoms, um, and changes across their entire physiology. But one of the things we found back then, and it was almost like a, a look-see experiment at the time, uh, uh, was that the bacteria in the gut of these animals, months later, in adulthood, was different. That there was a signature of stress that we could detect in uh, these animals, uh, in their microbiome. And that really got us thinking about could this microbiome be very important for how the body deals with stress, and more importantly, how the brain deals with stress. So what is the microbiome? Well, we are living in a microbial world. And that's the reason I'm saying that is because you are, in terms of genes, in terms of genes, you are 99% microbial. It's quite humbling overall. If you think of the amount of taxpayers' money that the government has spent on the Human Genome Project and isolating all the genes, and that was only less than 1% of what you have uh, overall. And so that's quite important. It's, other, other statistics that are worth noting is, 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 is in, we have somewhere, now this is quite debated because in the last two weeks a paper has come out, it was thought we had about 10 times more uh, uh, bacterial cells than human cells. Now more recently, uh, that figure has been readjusted with technology advancing all the time, especially sequencing technology. And, and, and that's really advanced this field dramatically, the ability to be able to uh, uh, identify the bacterial strains. That figure may be more like 1.3 uh, to 1. So we're still more microbial, but not as much in terms of cells. And we get rid of microbial cells every day when we go to the bathroom. And so you can imagine that every time you go to the bathroom, perhaps you are becoming more human. <laughs> and that's something that is very humbling uh, to uh, think about. 
And we talk about uh, the microbiome very much, and, and, and I'm guilty of this too. We talk about it as if we're synonymous if we're talking about bacteria. But the microbiome is much more than bacteria. It's viruses and bacteriophages and fungi and a whole host of different other microorganisms <coughs> as well. Um, also worth noting is that the weight of your microbiome is about three pounds, which is about the weight of your brain. Also, as a neuroscientist, somewhat uh, humbling. And it plays key roles, as we heard uh, in the introduction, in terms of protective functions, structural functions, metabolic functions. It's made the cover of all of um, the science, what we call this in science, the science glamour magazines, the uh, science in nature, um, but also the lay press. And, and, and it's taken uh, a lot of the lay press and lay science press, the New York Times here. Um, the Economist had it under cover, so there must be money in it, and that keeps university administrators very happy uh, in general. So um, it, 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 it's a very exciting field. You can't open a science journal uh, nowadays without finding the microbiome involved in something. And maybe I should just comment on that, because I went to a meeting about Alzheimer's disease last year, and one of the cynical people, uh, as there are many tend to be in the audience, uh, who said to his neighbor, but I could hear it, he said, is there anything this microbiome isn't involved in? And then I kind of said, well, perhaps not, because you have to remember the microbes were there first. And everything we have has happened in the context of, of microorganisms. And that we're not actually, you know, we are co-evolved as humans with microorganisms. And so that's important. To, and I'll come back to that a little later because it's a point I want to stress when I talk about uh, a behavior. So where do we get our micro? biome from. Um, um, and for the most part, it's thought that we are uh, uh, sterile um, in, in utero, although there is now a microbiome being found in the placenta. So, you know, this has been challenged all the time. But for the most part, we get our frontier microorganisms as we are being born uh, from our moms as we emerge through the delivery canal. So in psychiatry, it's another thing, unfortunately, we can blame our mothers for, uh, <laughs> overall. And that is if we're born by normal uh, uh, vaginal delivery. Uh, but if you're born by C-section, uh, cesarean section, then it's a different story. And, and the, the microorganisms tend to be that of the skin, which are quite different. Because during pregnancy, the, the mom's microbiome changes to be, make it ready. And so uh, that's something people are now looking at developing strategies to try and make a C-section born infant's microbiome more like that of a, a vaginally born. And so a lot of work going into this. Uh, and as we know, uh, with, there is an increased uh, relative risk of asthma and allergy and diabetes in infants that are born by C-section, um, then we, we have to kind of look at this in, in, from a public health pers perspective. We're quite interested in that, in that conundrum as well from a brain health perspective because there's very little good data looking at, at brain health and, 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 and being born by C-section. We collaborated with, with a group earlier this year to look at autism uh, and uh, whether there was a link between autism and uh, being born by C-section. And initially we found there was. Uh, there would seem to be a 22% uh, inc increase in the relative risk of autism if you were born by C-section. Uh, and this is in a study where we looked at everyone born in the Stockholm area in Sweden, so it's over 3 million people uh, from 1970 onwards. And so the, the Scandinavians are amazing for having this type of data, and you're able to mine it because they have amazing health records, and you can look at it. And so a 22% increase sounds a lot, but to put that in perspective, instead of 10 out of 1,000 infants born uh, with autism, you're now at 12 out of 1,000. That's a 22% increase risk. So, so it's important, firstly, to do that. But, but then my epidemiology colleagues, and I've discovered working with epidemiologists, they can never prove anything is, is, is causal, but they can prove things are not causal. And so they went and they looked at what happens if one infant, uh, one brother and a sibling pair or, or a sister was born by C-section and the other wasn't. Did, they, did, did it persist? And it didn't. So there's something that was driving the, in the environment 
humans or genetics or whatever that's driving the C-section that might be leading to this small increased autism, but it's not the C-section itself. That said, we can't neglect with C-section rates rising to 70% in Brazil, 60% in parts of uh, China, in downtown Manhattan, really high C-section rates, Italy. And, you know, we need to be aware that we are interfering with our microbiome early in life by doing this, and there may be brain health consequences that we just don't know yet, and, 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 and that's important. What are the other factors early in life that can interfere with the microbiome and, 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 and what it can do? Well, um, a mode of nutritional provision, breastfeeding versus uh, a formula fed, and a lot of interest in the formula companies trying to make uh, the microbiome more like that of a breastfed infant, and so th this is quite a, a big area. Uh, if you're born preterm, uh, your base of your gut isn't ready for colonization, and they tend to be born by C-section, and their, their microbiomes are quite different. Uh, maternal infection, maternal stress. The studies we have uh, shown this, as well as studies from the Netherlands that a high perceived stress during pregnancy will change the mom's microbiome and then that will change what, get, what the infant gets. The same with gestational diabetes or other uh, effects in pregnancy will change the mom's microbiome and that will be passed on. The environment you live in, whether you live in a city or, 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 or um, uh, uh, the, the countryside, is also changing the, the microbiome uh, very much. Um, there is a whole new field of the microbiome of the built environment. That's the microbiome around the air, all around us here, how uh, buildings are designed, or how airflow travels within buildings. And people are beginning to look at this in the context of mental health, and not only in hospital design or, or office design, but even in home design in, in relation to it. And there is an interface now between architecture and the microbiome that we would never have uh, anticipated. Um, antibiotics, I'll come back to because that's very important. Uh, hospitalization, of course, uh, and uh, host genetics. Twin studies from the UK have shown that about 42% of your microbiome is determined by your genetics. So I might have, and I, no pun intended, poo-pooed the 1% of your, ge your genome, but it does play a very strong role in what microbiome you have. So that's also uh, quite um, important uh, overall. The other factor um, that uh, um, is important for your microbiome is, because your microbiome, it's, it, as you're born, it, it basically stabilizes by the age of three, two to three, we think. And then uh, as you uh, grow up, uh, it, it gets different insults. And then as you age, it starts to decline again. And so there is a lot of work now beginning to go into uh, the microbiome at different developmental windows and uh, as we age. And I just wanted to mention this guy, uh, Mechnikov, who's really the father of microbiome research. But he won the Nobel Prize over 100 years ago for his work on uh, immunology. And he discovered uh, the, uh, the um, phagocytes, the main uh, uh, immune cells that gobble up uh, things that we don't want. But as happens, some scientists later in their career, they start going a bit off the grid and coming up with some crazy ideas. And because they're so famous, people will entertain it for a while. And he started to come up with really crazy ideas that people really didn't take too seriously. Because uh, he was wondering, why do we live some people live longer than others. And so he noticed that people who lived in Eastern Europe, parts of Bulgaria in particular, tended to live longer. And so he was like, what's different about them? And so what he noticed was that they ate a lot of fermented foods, especially foods containing lactic acid bacteria. And so he's written about it over 100 years ago that diet and lactic acid bacteria uh, could be good for increasing your longevity. And so this was kind of ignored for at least 60, 70 years. But he is now the father of what we call probiotic research because he really put forward this concept of probiotics <laughs> having health benefits and that this might be useful for aging and the aging brain. Now my colleagues in, in Cork uh, did a study a couple of years ago that was published in the journal Nature. 
And what they did was they took 180 elderly people and followed them up for two years uh, and looked at their microbiome over this period. And what they found was that as these, and, and what was good about it was some of these people transitioned from living in the community to going to hospital, to going to rehab, to going into assisted uh, living, and well, nursing homes as we call them in Ireland. And so um, what they found was that the uh, diversity of the microbiome was a great prediction of, a predictor of their health. So the more diverse their microbiome, the better their health outcomes. And they were able to show that where they lived it had a big influence on the diversity of the microbiome. And if you were in assisted living, in Ireland at least, it, they tended to have a lot of repetitive, the same type of food, some of it a rice pudding type, heavily processed, uh, and not that, in, you know, these people used to eat a lot of green vegetables and be out in the community, and now are having a much narrower diet. That has a narrower effect on their microbiome, and it really uh, was changing their health outcomes. So, the implications for this is huge, not only in the elderly population. It, it has tells us that if you have a diverse diet, you can maintain a diverse microbiome, and that can really help your uh, gut health, your brain health, and all of your immune health and metabolic health as well. So it, it has huge implications. But in terms of aging, what it allows us to do is, is think about the processes that are going on in the aging brain in particular. And we have a, a process that we, that's commonly known as inflam aging. So basically, as we age, we, we're more susceptible to inflammation and peripheral inflammation. That gets to the brain and your brain starts to become a little bit more inflamed and it's chronic and it slowly wears down the brain cells and there are factors that we know that can increase it and the, the, the center here is an expert in being able to try and, 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 and counteract some of these biological effects. What we've shown here now is that the gut-brain axis, which has been ignored in this field, is really central to it. And the other thing is, because I'm interested in stress, um, it's important to realize that stress will have different effects depending on when it occurs. And stress in the elderly is very, uh, it can have a very different effect, especially because barrier function in the gut is already a, 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 a bit compromised, and you can have a much bigger inflammatory phenotype uh, as well as changes in brain. And so when these come together, it does like add fuel to the fire of the inflammation process, and so that we will have cognitive impairment and anxiety and depression, and most notably uh, social isolation. And so uh, understanding these mechanisms, we feel, is very important uh, for moving forward. But also, there, uh, you know, it, this also has a, a ramifications for even in the normal adult brain. So we're beginning to really tease this apart, this brain-good axis, to understand how the microbes and their metabolites can play a role in it, and how this is very well studied in the context of metabolism and food intake. And uh, we can intervene with diets or with certain probiotics if they have the science behind them. Or we're studying trying to identify bioactives from bacteria that will induce the same type of effect. And they should be able to help counteract the effects of stress, especially on the immune system, and then help with the aging process and in mental health processes as we move forward. So the evidence we have for that I'm going to share with you now. So how do we study this microbiome? And, and, and I'm a basic scientist, and, and, and we do everything from basic animal work all the way to humans in, our, in my lab. And so, and, and, and we like to stress and so we can do a lot more stress work in, in animals than we can in humans in an ethical sense, but we do both, and I, I, I'll talk about that. But one of the ways that if you want to show something is involved in a process is the main way from an engineering perspective is to get rid of it 
and see how that process works. And so the idea of living in a germ-free world has really entranced people for a long, long time. Here's a science fiction story from 1927 about a germ-free uh, individual. And so in the 1940s all the way to the 60s, um, mice were generated that were growing up in a, in, 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 in a um, completely germ-free environment. And we've been studying them. We have one of these facilities in Cork, uh, and we've been studying these animals. And why we're interested in them is because um, I told you all earlier that we've seen that stress affects the microbiome composition. Well, if we take out the microbiome, we found that these had an exaggerated stress response. And this is work that was done in, um, in Japan initially but, and, and, and also that, that we have. Uh, shown. And so I won't go into the details, but just to highlight some of the things that we've shown, if these microbes are taken out, the brain does not develop in the same way. So when we look at these animals' brains, their um, uh, plasticity-related proteins like brain-derived neurotrophic factor, don't worry, but it's very important for learning and memory. And that is decreased in the hippocampus, the key brain area uh, that is involved in, uh, in, in cognition. Uh, we've shown more recently that the birth of new neurons, new brain cells, which happen, like, we, we used to think this, was, this didn't happen, but now we know that while even you're here, those of you awake uh, while you're listening to me, um, <laughs> that you will be getting new neurons slowly being formed. And we've shown that this is regulated by uh, the microbiome. In a paper that we just got accepted this week, we've shown that myelin, myelination, myelin is very important in, 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 in being the insulation in, our, in, in how neurons conduct. And we know that myelin starts to uh, decrease in disorders like multiple sclerosis. We've shown that myelin in the prefrontal cortex area of the brain is under the complete control of the microbiome through studies in these germ-free uh, animals. And one of the things I wanted to share with you, because we found that most of these effects were more prevalent in males than female animals. And if you're a stress researcher, most stress-related disorders tend to happen or occur high, in higher levels in females than males. Depression, anxiety, irritable bowel syndrome. So, but we're finding the male brain is somewhat more vulnerable to uh, uh, gut-brain signaling dysfunction. And so that led us to somewhere where we hadn't planned on going, but it started thinking about male-specific neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum disorder or schizophrenia. And um, at the core of these disorders is uh, uh, deficits in sociability. And, 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 and uh, we were quite interested in to see, well, what would happen if we take microbes out and does it affect social behavior? And we do this in an animal. And in our um, germ-free animals, if we give them the opportunity to explore in, in a box uh, another mouse or an empty chamber, mice, like most mammals and humans, are quite social, so they'll, they'll gravitate towards the other mouth. But not if they don't have, uh, have a bacteria in their gut. They weren't able to distinguish. They had key social deficits. Mice, like some humans, are a little bit fickle. So if you give them the opportunity to spend time with a mouse uh, that they um, know or a new playmate, they will gravitate towards the new playmate. And they're able to distinguish this. And this is social cognition. And we can look at this very well. And indeed, uh, the germ-free animals, the mice without the microbes, weren't able to make the, this distinction. So th these are two of the core symptoms at the, in, in autism. And so we're able to recapitulate it. We also looked at this from a repetitive behaviors which is also seen in autism, and these animals have much more repetitive behaviors. Um, this is quite intriguing because it does link the microbiome to autism in a very strong way. And studies, other studies in, in mice have emerged where if you think of the two clinical risk factors that we know for autism, one is exposure to infection in pregnancy, um, and the other is exposure to a drug called valproate. It's an anticonvulsant or, uh, and also a mood stabilizer. And both of them have known to, to, to have uh, links with autism uh, that are proven. Um, 
in animals, if you do the same thing, you get changes in the microbiome and changes in behavior. And, so, and some of these could be reversed with a specific bacteria. So the field is really moving towards trying to understand what's going on in relation to autism and the microbiome. But it's still very early days, and this, I will say, is animal studies, so we still have a long way to go. What it allowed me to start thinking about was uh, from an evolutionary perspective. Why on earth would I need bacteria in my gut to be a, the social person that I am? Uh, you know, why would we have evolved to require bacteria to be social? And so uh, we know from the social brain and, 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 and brain elaboration uh, or, or, uh, over evolution that, that um, being in social groups has fostered that and it's called the Dunbar theories of the social brain development. And now I've shown that microbes are very important for uh, social behavior and microbes are also important for brain development. So I started to think about this a lot and I started coming up with ideas together with, with, with the postdoc Roman Stilling and I started saying, well what's in it for the microbes? <laughs> because when you talk about evolution you kind of have to think, well what's, you know, what's driving this in terms of fitness? And um, I I said this to a collaborator in, in Vanderbilt, uh, who's an evolutionary microbiologist, and his reply to me was, John, this is the wrong question. Because you have to remember, as I've already told you, the microbes were there first. And so all of brain development and all of social development has occurred in the context of microbes being there. So that's important to do. And we have a long way to go to try and figure all of that out. The other thing we have a long way to go is trying to figure out all of these signaling mechanisms that microbes, uh, how you can get from the gut to the brain. Um, I mentioned the vagus already. Uh, we know barrier function is very important. Uh, what's very important to remember is these bacteria are little factories for producing neuroactive chemicals. And some of these chemicals we don't produce ourselves without the bacteria being there. So the bacteria act on certain substances in our diet, often fibers, to produce very unique chemicals that wouldn't be there otherwise, that can signal, that can get to the blood and then signal to the brain. And we're slowly beginning to work this pathways out, but it is uh, one thing that we are very intrigued about. And this slide is, it, it, this slide is, is um, not working. Uh, this slide uh, is, again, the one that I, I, I'd like you to, to focus on because it, it kind of summarizes where the field is going. If you just focus on the bottom part, this is what modern biological psychiatry research is all about. It's about trying to figure out what's going on in the brain, what are the processes in the, in the brain across our lifespan that uh, give us vulnerability to certain uh, uh, mental illnesses. And understanding how they, how they occur is very important. And, but now we have a new player this microbiome, and we need to juxtapose what's going on with the microbiome and how that is interacting with the brain at these key uh, points. We're very interested in, in, as I mentioned already, in early life and in old age, but also we have a program built around adolescence, I have a new, you know, what, what I call the teenage wasteland, and understanding the teen brain, and because if what's happening at that stage is very different, a lot of synaptic pruning and a lot of, uh, 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 of avenues in which the microbiome can influence what's going on uh, overall. So I, I, I mentioned already about how stress uh, is important, that uh, stress will change the microbiome, uh, especially early in life. Mice lacking the microbiome have an exaggerated uh, stress response. They've altered neurodevelopment and changes in anxiety and cognition and social behavior. So that leads us to the question, uh, could uh, the microbiome be gated uh, to actually modulate how we deal with stress? And again, we wanted to test this. We tested this initially in animal experiments. So what we wanted to do was to take normal, healthy mice and feed them with a potential probiotic, a lactobacillus, rhamnosus. We chose a bacteria that was not commercially available because we didn't want to be a slave to any specific company or anything like that. So it was one that came out of our, our, our research. And, and then 
we, we fed it to mice for a number of weeks, and we looked at how animals respond. And this is, you, may, you won't be familiar with this, but if you um, put a mouse on a maze like this, where it has access to an open or closed arms, mice will stay in the closed arms. If you give them mice drugs like Valium, they'll come out here and be a little bit reckless. And this is widely used in the pharmaceutical industry to screen for anxiolytic drugs. So your Valium or your Xanax, it's this type of mouse. And what we found was that our mice that had been given the lactobacillus behaved as if they already were on a benzodiazepine, already on Xanax, and they were chilled out. This is an inescapable stress test, and mice are good swimmers, but they don't like to swim, and so they give up after a while. And if you give them any type of antidepressant drug, they will continue. And so our, our mice on this lactobacillus behaved as if they were already on Prozac. And that was quite dramatic findings for us. When we stress the animals, when you stress animals, um, the, uh, is there anyone who can fix my forward thing? Um, when you stress animals, you get a, um, a court response, or a hormone response, um, that is uh, normal how we deal with the environment. But when you stress animals that have been given this lactobacillus, it was greatly reduced. They were quite chilled out and relaxed. And so we have behavior changes, now physiology changes. What's going on in the brain? When we looked at the uh, receptors in the brain that Valium work on the GABA receptors, we found wide-scale changes. And remember, these are healthy animals. So it's quite a, a dramatic uh, 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 finding. But how? How could a bacteria in your gut, in a normal healthy situation, affect such a wide-scale aspect of stress and anxiety? And I already mentioned the Vegas Nerve, and together with John Beanstalk's group in, in Canada and McMaster, we uh, basically cut this highway of communication. We performed what's called a vagotomy. And so in, in cutting this, we stopped you know, the ability of, of, of potentially of bacteria to be able to signal. And all of the effects that we had seen went. The behavior, the physiology, and the brain chemistry. And what this tells us is that what happens in Vegas uh, will uh, uh, affect your emotion. And how important the vagus nerve is as a potential signaling pathway. And you may be aware that we use vagus nerve stimulation to treat chronic pain in epilepsy as well as in refractory depression already, and a lot of work uh, going into the, expanding its role in, in neuro re rehabilitation as well. So we're really, you know, moving forward and getting at some of these mechanisms. And um, it did, you know, it, 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 it's quite important to do that. Um, and this is a cartoon from the dreaded Daily Mail in Britain, where when our paper came out, this was the cartoon they met about it, a uh, kind of cynical approach. But it is important uh, to, to remember that we're still a long way uh, from figuring out how this occurs and how much it occurs in humans. And, and, and we have a lot of fun in trying to figure, in, in trying to tease it apart. The other area of um, microbial medicine that, that I, I would be remiss of me not to mention to you <laughs> is the whole area of uh, fecal microbiota transplantations, taking someone else's poo. Would you do it? Would anyone do it? Yes. Yeah. Oh, your Texans are good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely would do it if you had a retractable uh, C. diff, Clostridium difficile infection. Um, this is a hospital-borne infection where uh, people, it, it's caused by antibiotics, it's treated by antibiotics, and people die. And there was a study a number of years ago where they had to stop the study because there was a 90% success rate by taking uh, a, tra a fecal transplant from a close uh, uh, relative. And so it's really changing what we think about what is a medicine, and how do we package medicine, how do we regulate medicine in a different way. Um, but what is it, it's really an extreme way of, if you see your microbiome as a lawn 
in your in your gut and this is and we can treat your lawn with food and you can treat your lawn with, 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 with putting in certain uh, seeds to try and cover up the, the bad patches and get rid of the sun damage but eventually sometimes you just have to get rid of the lawn and put down new grass and that's what the transplant is kind of like and in a way uh, it, it's changing so much about what we are so what about it in brain health now, I'm terrified to look at what's going on on YouTube uh, with it, um, and there's no published data that I'm aware of. It has expanded to inflammatory bowel disease, it has it, it expanded to other metabolic diseases, uh, but nothing that I'm aware of in brain health. But there is a very intriguing animal study where they looked at two different strains of mice that had two different microbiomes, and they also have very different anxiety-like behaviors. This is a very anxious animal, this is a very normal animal. And this is a transplant. And they basically turned this animal into a, a susceptible and vice versa. And this is huge, if this could be reproduced into humans, would have huge uh, implications. Not only if you ever did have to have a transplant for C. difficile, you should really check the psychological profile <laughs> of your daughter. Just in case. Just in case. We've recently taken a microbiome from depressed patients which have a, a much narrower microbiome and we've even transplanted them into animals and we're able to create a depression like physiology and inflammatory. So there's a huge power and it's helping us to get at some of the causal effects of whether the micro how much the microbiome is involved. Very intriguing and, and, and very exciting. So, most of what I've told you is built on basic science concepts and coming from animal models. But we need to move into the human domain and to, to, to test this appropriately. And my colleague, uh, Ted Dynan and Catherine Stanton, uh, we've come up with this concept of psychobiotics. This is bacteria which taken in adequate amounts will confer a uh, mental health benefit. And this has attracted a lot of attention in, in the New York Times and, and Focus magazine and other ways. But it allows us now to take uh, bacteria that come from our preclinical studies and test them now in humans. And this is Andrew, one of our postdocs, who's looking at doing some EEG uh, in uh, people that are um, uh, have been taking a bifidobacteria for a number of weeks. And so what we found is that you can detect by EEG, which is just monitoring electrical activity, a signature of changes in brain activity that are due to taking a single bacteria in a healthy student population. I wouldn't say normal, I said healthy, because uh, they're students. Uh, but uh, we also looked at the effects of this uh, potential bacteria on anxiety. And, it, and we also stress individuals in the lab, and we find that it dampens down the stress response. So this is really exciting because it, it's changing how we think about developing new strategies for uh, stress, anxiety, etc. Moreover, imaging studies from UCLA, uh, from Emmer and Myers group, have shown that they can we detect using brain imaging signatures in healthy volunteers again of uh, uh, taking uh, specific bacterial strains. But the struggle we have is trying to understand why some bacteria are going to have positive effects, and the vast vast majority, and almost all of which are available in the US, will, in commercially, are not going to have any effect at all because they haven't, we ha they haven't been tested to see the mechanisms of how they work. But it's a very exciting time and we'll have more human data emerging over the next uh, while. But it also brings me back to this whole concept about who's in control. And hopefully I've kind of given you a whistle-stop tour of some of where we were thinking that perhaps it may not be the brain. And just as in, in life, where I've come to realize that the person who's really in control is often the, in my case, the wife or the partner of the person who takes they're in control. Uh, and that maybe this is the same with uh, ourselves in relation to our microbiome and our brain uh, activity. And so that's really what where we're getting to. In, in the last century, we focused a lot of our efforts on trying to kill bacteria in microbial medicine, saving billions of lives and, 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 and having amazing. Now, 
modern medicine is really appreciating how important the microbiome is and how important it is for maintaining health and that we need to try and keep our microbiome healthy. And to do that, we need to try and have a diverse diet, rich in fibers and green fibers in particular. We need to try and avoid antibiotics as much as we can. We need to try and uh, avoid stress. Uh, living in a hyper clean world is probably not the best thing for our microbiomes overall. Uh, we need to try and avoid uh, being born by C-section and try and have being breastfed, but that's not in our hands, but in, our, in that of our, 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 our parents. But, but these are the factors that we're beginning to really understand. And that to have a healthy brain, uh, 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 we need to have a healthy gut and that when we don't, things start to go wrong. And so in a way, it reminds me a, a little bit of, um, you, and, and they're also here in the US, these TV shows that uh, uh, came from the UK, like uh, Upstairs, Downstairs, or Downton Abbey. And it, 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 for, in, in these TV shows, you have two populations living in the same house who more or less ignore each other as much as they can, but th they require each other to exist. But it's only when things start to go wrong downstairs that the real drama occurs upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> so my concluding note to you is that your, your state of gut uh, will markedly affect your state of mind. And so we, we might be in a New York state of mind, but maybe in a Texas state of gut. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is the work of an awful lot of people in my group. I, 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 I just want to sh share that it's a lot of a lot of work over uh, some amazing scientists from all over the world, including from the U.S. I work I work closely with the, the psychiatrist Ted Dynan and with some of our industry partners and our funding agencies, and and it's been really a, an enjoyable journey. And I hope that you will take something out of this uh, tonight. And I'd like to thank my microbiome uh, for allowing me to. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we've got about five minutes for questions. If you're in the reception hall, there'll be somebody back there that'll bring a three by five card. Okay, come back. Dang, fan. Can you move this? I've been told for years that neurotransmitters are produced in the gut. Can you comment on that, please? Oh yes, 95% uh, um, of your serotonin is produced in the gut. Uh, so uh, all of the major neurotransmitters are produced in the gut and bacteria can regulate that production. The problem we have, or the, 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 the part of the puzzle that's missing is how do they, can they change what's going on in the brain if they're in the gut? And we have this uh, enteric nervous system, the second brain, and so a lot of these neurotransmitters can tinker with that, and that signals to the brain, so it's indirect, but yes. Well, we have uh, some friends that go through a cleansing periodically, where they stop eating or they drink a little olive oil, kind of restart their microbiome, or are they doing something good or bad? Or so extreme diets will, will really impact the microbiome and, and are probably not to be advised in relation to maintaining the, because you may lose uh, a certain bacteria that you may not get back again. We as, a, I didn't go into it, but, but we as a Western society have lost a lot of bacteria that you can still detect in hunter-gatherers in Tanzania or in the Mary Indians in the Amazon. So what we're doing in our diets is impinging on it. And so extreme diets will affect it. It's hard to know, and more work is needed to be done. And that's always my answer to almost everything, unfortunately. But I would say it's better not to, to wipe out, uh, you know, to have such extreme changes because it allows bacteria that to grow that you may not want to grow. Yes, so uh, since bacteria taken orally is so devastating or to, to, the back, to the bacteria in the gut, why don't they come up with a different vector, you know, like, of course, a shot, but patches, like we get hormones, suppositories, and that way it wouldn't go through the gut and be so devastating to it. You mean antibiotics or? Yeah. 
Yeah, a local. Well, in, in dental work, they would be trying to keep some antibiotics local. Uh, some antibiotics are not systemic; they only work in the gut, like rifaximin. They, but they want to be useful for gut diseases. So people have tried to do that, but but, but when you have an infection, it, it 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 tends to be in many places. So it is a good point. But but the other point is that people aren't interested in anti antibiotics because they're most of them are off patent, and so there isn't as much interest in developing new ways of formulating antibiotics. As there should be. So I wanted to follow up on something you said at the end about the commercially available probiotics. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about, in terms of the number of bacteria we think are out there, how many have we identified and how many are available and it, does it do any good to try to ingest probiotics either through... Yeah. Great question. I, 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 it's an interesting thing that you will not be aware of. The word probiotic means bacteria, live bacteria, which taken in adequate amounts will confer a health benefit. Now, for something to confer a health benefit, you have to prove it has a health benefit. <laughs> and so, in the European Union, uh, they've now banned the word probiotic. So you will not you go into uh, 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 supermarket in France and the home of Nestle and, and, uh, and Danone and you will not find probiotics. It's not used because you, there's no, the clinical trials haven't been done. And so a lot of what's available, I was in Walgreens today just checking out, you know, and I was like, you know, a lot of, a lot of what's available, ha they haven't done the studies. So they don't even know that they get past the, the stomach acid in the first instance. So where there are, the first part of your question, there are you know, thousands and thousands of different strains out there that can be capable of doing different things. And we're always looking for new ones coming from weird sources. But, um, uh, and so the, 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 it's endless what it could be. But what we need is very good clinical trials. Uh, and we need food companies to invest in it and, and uh, to, to, to show that this strain is having a positive effect on, in terms of whatever they're looking at. And so the culture needs to change like that. And if you can market something in the US without having to do, spend millions on trials, which is the case now, then we're, we're all just shooting in the dark. No one would go into a pharmacy and say, drugs are good, I'll take a drug for my headache. Uh, but that's what we're doing. We're going in and we're saying probiotics are good, bacteria, we'll just take that. And, and luckily, most of the probiotics are not going to have side effects like a lot of drugs, but it's still, you know, they're not going to have any effects that we know of. So I was, uh, I was born via C-section. And, yeah. and it actually hit home because... 13% of the audience here, and so like, you, you are not alone. And then, I've, you know, it, when I was little, I had acute asthma outbreaks, uh, which stopped. But I, I still have terrible allergies, and I found that local uh, wildflower honey has helped and pulling us in. But is there anything else I can do on a microbiome level to help cure myself of we, these allergies? We, we just don't know enough yet in relation to uh, adult allergy and how to manage it. In, there's some really exciting work coming out in infants looking at prebiotics, which are the uh, food and which bacteria uh, thrive on. So the people are looking at developing specific formulas in infants, but in adults yet, I haven't seen any data that would say, you know, but keep your microbiome as diverse as possible. <laughs> That's all. That's my number one advice to everyone. You know. I almost am afraid to ask this, but how would you sample the microbiome in a human? I mean, it's not oh. blood draw. Oh, it's, 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 microbiome is one of the easiest things to sample. Um, it, it, you know, um, so there is a, 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 a thing called the American Gut Project. It's a crowdfunding project. Uh, they basically, you can send your uh, who, as you know, uh, uh, to them, uh, and they will they will send you back your data, what your microbiome is like. It costs about seventy nine dollars, and they keep all the information, so they get all the metadata, your age, everything on, on it. But but they they do it from people from home, and they have done it for thousands. It's out of the, it's out of the University of Colorado, and it is an amazing project because we we are now able to see you know answer some of these questions. But it's just that they send you a little stool container and, 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 and it's, you put it in the toilet and you just, yeah. <laughs> I have, you know, it, 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 it's not, it doesn't sound the most, you know, it's not a great pre-dinner conversation, but, but, but it, 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 it is, people, in the next 10 years, 
you will go to your doctor and get your microbiome sampled. And you will be, uh, individually, people will be charting their microbiome over time like they will their cholesterol or anything else. And there is even ideas, because people are developing um, artificial microbiomes, uh, pro uh, uh, projects like uh, Repopulate. And uh, <laughs> there are microbiome banks. Uh, there are companies who have set up microbiome banks. But you may want to, when you're 80 years old, you may want to, uh, and you've tried everything else, and, but you may want to take your 30-year-old microbiome and see if it will help. And people are going to be are looking at this uh, more and more. And so it's a whole new change in what we're doing. And you know, it sounds outlandish, and I, I, I'm a bit facetious about it, but, but, but it is important to realize that it's changing the face of what we know in medicine, and, and really is. What effect are you seeing from the treatment of GERD with things like Prilosec and all those medications yeah. that so many people take? Oh, amazing, a great question, and I didn't have time to go into it. What we're, uh, there's a recent paper with, with, with uh, proton pump inhibitors showing that they uh, really impact the microbiome, but the, there's another side to it. And, and this is really important. The microbiome affects how we metabolize drugs, certain drugs. So we've shown that side effects of, of antipsychotics, weight gain, is due to the microbiome. There's a paper that came out from Baylor in, in Houston before Christmas showing that specific chemotherapeutic drugs cancer drugs, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, the, the, their efficacy was totally dependent on whether you had a certain microbiome or not. And, and so there's a real interaction between drugs and microbiome and microbiome and drugs that we had no idea about before. And, and statins and, and diabetic drugs and all of them are, 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 are going to be regulated by how our microbiome is as well. So I know we could go all night, and I could too. Uh, thank you so much, John. My that was pleasure. so great. Our talk starts and ends with our brain, even though he thinks the gut. Uh, can you? I've already thought of ten research projects we're going to start doing together. Because as we do the vagus nerve stimulation, we're going to be able to test what's going on, right? Yeah. As well as the brain, so we'll be able to answer some of those questions. We do hope you'll be one of our friends and join and also continue to come here. We won't ask you to leave a little sample of your... No. Uh, <laughs> but just think, to understand your brain, who knew? And that's what you came here for. Thank you so much for supporting us. We'll see you next year.